It was a hell in war. Now it's it's hell in action. It's fucking hard. The Moria fire smoldered over several days, displacing thousands of people and reducing to ashes the epicenter of the European Union's carceral archipelago. The camp, located on the Greek island of Lesbos, across the western coast of Turkey, was first established in 2013 as a transit center for people crossing the Aegean Sea into Europe, built on a former military camp. In 2016, in response to the so-called refugee crisis and with the backing of the EU, the Greek government imposed severe restrictions on movement from all frontier islands, turning Moria into a dead end, a permanent site of incarceration, widely described as an open-air prison. As people continued to arrive on the island, but were barred from moving onward to the mainland, Moria's population grew significantly. The camp expanded into the surrounding olive groves, creating new zones, which in turn became severely overcrowded, resulting in precarious and unsafe living conditions. Within a volatile landscape that was increasingly prone to fire. When the first case of COVID-19 was identified in Moria one week before the September fire, Instead of alleviating pressure by safely transferring people to the mainland, local authorities put the camp in quarantine, in a cramped and unsanitary state, even while social distancing rules were in place for the rest of the Greek population. On the same day that the Moria Six were arrested, the Greek Minister of Migration and Asylum announced that the arsonists of Moria have been detained and everyone's safety is guaranteed. What followed was a gross miscarriage of justice. Five of the Moria Six were identified and convicted on the testimony of a single person, reportedly the leader of a rival ethnic community in the camp. Greek authorities failed to locate him and secure his presence in court as a witness. Forensic architecture and forensics were commissioned by the lawyers representing the young asylum seekers to map how the fire developed on the 8th of September and to cross-examine the key witness statement. We collected and examined hundreds of videos, images, testimonies, and official reports, and consulted fire experts. A large part of this material consisted of footage shot by young migrants, students of Refocus Media Labs, an organization training refugees on the island on filmmaking and reporting. We extracted the times encoded in the metadata of that footage. And cross-reference that with additional open source imagery. To create a video timeline of the night. To locate the material in space, we obtained high-resolution drone footage that captured the camp both in early 2020, at the peak of its expansion, and in October 2020, one month after its destruction. Using a computational process known as photogrammetry, we converted the drone footage into navigable 3D models, which represented the state of the camp before and after the fire. Drone and ground-level footage allowed us to precisely model significant elements, such as the main electrical infrastructure and parts of the complex grid of ad hoc electrical wiring in the overspill camp, a network of wires, plugs, sockets and flimsy connections, 
built by migrants themselves in order to compensate for the camp's inadequate electricity supply. This infrastructure, together with environmental features such as the terrain's topography, functioned as visual markers to accurately locate multiple images and videos within our 3D model and to determine the relations between them. This also allowed us to simulate lighting conditions on the night and to reconstruct the spread of fire. We mark in orange the area that we see burning in any video whose timing we could confirm. The first video to capture fire in the immediate vicinity of the camp, in the area bordering Zone 6, was shot at the latest at 11.36 pm from the neighboring village of Moria. At 1 minute past midnight, we see the same fire in this video filmed inside Zone 6. alongside another outbreak at a hill further away from the camp. By 16 minutes past midnight, the fire in Zone 6 appears to have expanded inside the camp, near and into an area known as Safe Zone, a separate fenced-off section which hosted and accompanied minors. Footage shot from the road next to the Safe Zone at 5 minutes to 1 am shows the fire spreading rapidly from one container to the next. The intense heat appears to cause frequent electrical short circuits. There is electric shock, you can see that the light. As you can see, there is electric shock is happening over there. Around the same time, another video shows a large fire spreading within a densely built area at the center of the camp, made of makeshift wooden structures and plastic tarpaulin covers. Strong winds blowing at an average of 8 meters per second and with gusts up to 12 spread the fire rapidly across the flammable and tightly packed structures. Hindi, Ruibari Yoreliva, Tishkirifta, Ruibari Yoreliva, Bacha. By 1 am, flames had engulfed different parts of the camp and people were trying to flee. <laughs> Also by that time, police had been deployed to the area in large numbers, but rather than help, they attacked the fleeing and protesting crowd with tear gas. They are using tear gas to the families. They are using tear gas. Oh, yeah. 
compounding the already suffocating atmosphere with toxic chemicals. Oh, Ashkara! Tear gas, tear gas! Between 1 and 1.30 a.m., fires spread rapidly in the center of the camp. By that time, the fire had reached the camp's pre-removal center. A fenced off facility where people awaiting deportation were imprisoned, known as Prokeka. According to one of the police officers in charge of the facility, Prokeka had only been evacuated shortly before and only after the detainees themselves broke out of their ward into the fenced-off yard, seeking safety. At 2 a.m., the fire had spread further towards the west and south of the camp. Camp residents continued to record its rapid expansion. <laughs> و جامعه جهانی است که همه مردم در اینجا کنار هم در این اردوگاه شلوغ کرونا گرفتن کنار هم هستند و بسیار ناراحتن که چرا هیچ کس رسیدگی نمیکنه به وضعیت ما including neighboring Zone 12, was on fire, and more and more people were trying to reach a place of safety. The number that I saw of people living in Moria, it's less than 6,000, 4,000. I don't know, there's a lot of explosions like that. And also, I don't know where's the rest of the people. There are some people stuck in the middle of Moria, surrounded by the fire. Altercations were reported between migrants and locals in the neighboring village of Moria, with some of the residents attempting to prevent the fleeing migrants from passing through. At the same time, police set up roadblocks along the road leading to the town of Mitilini to prevent migrants from reaching it, as shown in this clip. The fires smoldered until the early hours of September 9th, when documentation became more sporadic, as most people had fled the area. We used remote sensing techniques to track the full extent of the areas that burned that night. The location and extent of the burnt scars confirm our mapping of the fire outbreaks as recorded in the footage. In orange are fires we could see and geolocate through videos. And in yellow we mark the extended areas that burned as a consequence of these fires, but were not themselves recorded burning. 
Using this diagram, we revisit the key witnesses statement, on the basis of which the young asylum seekers were convicted, to examine its veracity. According to the statement, on the night of the 8th of September, the witness was outside his tent in Zone 12, when he saw a large fire burning through the area of a Dutch, a reference to the nationality of the eight workers in that part of the camp, which is noted to be Zone 9. Analysis of satellite imagery shows, however, that contrary to this claim, Zone 9 was not burned that night but on the following nights of the 9th and 10th of September. A few minutes after seeing Zone 9 on fire, the witness remembers noticing smoke and flames near his tent, at which point he saw a group of young people putting fires everywhere in Zone 12, which spread quickly throughout the entire zone. In his statement, he claims to have identified five of the defendants as part of this group. Although the exact location of the witness's tent in Zone 12 remains unknown, the entire zone is situated on a slope rising above the camp, offering panoramic views to most of the settlement. The first time we see Zone 12 in flames is in this video, shot at 1.43 am from across the camp. By this time, most of the center and south of the official camp has already been reduced to ashes. As clearly seen from these images, taken from various locations in Zone 12 that night, it would have been impossible for the witness to miss the high flames at the center of the camp before Zone 12 caught fire. Lastly, according to the official report of the Mytilene Fire Service, Zone 12 was burnt from fires spreading from the center of the camp due to the strong prevailing winds. Our analysis of the progression of the fire in that part of the camp confirms the fire service's report mapping a pattern of fire spread that is consistent with the wind direction. According to scientific studies, fire branding is one of the most common causes of fire spread in informal settlements. Fire brands, sometimes referred to as red snow, are airborne burning particles rising from a fire, which are commonly known to cause further ignition when landing on flammable surfaces. The vast majority of Moria camp was ad hoc shelters built from plastic, polystyrene, wood and tarpaulin, all highly flammable materials. Firebrands, travelling downwind and landing on these shelters, can ignite new fires called spot fires. In order to determine whether firebrands could have travelled downwind from the centre of the camp, igniting Zone 12, we consulted kindling a non-profit which works to promote fire safety, particularly in informal settlements. According to Kindling, in the prevailing wind conditions of average 8 meters per second, firebrands could have traveled well over 50 meters, depending on their size and density, and on the intensity of the fire. The intensity of the fire is determined by the heat release rate of the burning mass. Previous tests that have been conducted on combustion in informal settlements show that a 9 square meter dwelling of timber and steel construction can release up to 6 to 10 megawatts of heat, suggesting that such a range would be a suitable reference for the intensity of the fire in Moria Camp. In our analysis, we were able to identify such instances of long firebrand travel in the footage. This video, shot at 1.31 am, 12 minutes before Zone 12 was first seen in flames, captures an explosion with burning material splitting into smaller firebrands and travelling downwind. 
We placed the footage within our 3D model and measured the range of distances within which the firebrands land. Projecting this two-dimensional trajectory against the prevailing wind direction at night, we measured that these firebrands cover a distance of 100 to 170 meters, landing in zone 12. Our analysis thus shows that the spread of the fire from the center of the camp to Zone 12 can be attributed to fire branding, corroborating the findings of the fire service. And it also foregrounds further inconsistencies in the key witness's testimony, raising significant doubts about its veracity. The fire of the 8th of September 2020 was the last in a series of at least 247 outbreaks in and around the camp since its establishment in 2013. Over this data, we superimposed the monthly figures for arrivals of migrants on Lesbos and the rising occupancy of the camp across the seven years of its operation. The camp's population began to rise significantly after restrictions on movement were imposed in March 2016 even though exclusionary EU policies led to lower levels of arrivals than in previous years. As the camp became increasingly overcrowded, the frequency of fires, as well as their size and intensity, continued to rise. In early 2020, during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, and only a few months before Moria burned to the ground, the camp's population peaked at nearly 20,000 people close to seven times its official capacity. Almost half of the recorded outbreaks, at least 112, occurred in 2020 alone. Recurring fires in the camp were the result of shifting carceral policies amidst the warming climate. September, late summer, is when the ground is driest in this Mediterranean region. Dry conditions, combined with the precarity and density imposed by Greek and EU authorities, led to steep increase in large fires every year around this time. Despite this ever-present lurking risk, no mitigating safety measures were put in place to alleviate the pressure. Viewed against this recurring pattern of fire, neither the September 2020 blaze which destroyed the camp nor any of those in which lives were lost in previous years, were isolated incidents. Rather, there were symptoms and material manifestations of intersecting phenomena. Chronic overcrowding, EU and state policies, failing humanitarian infrastructure, prolonged droughts and heat waves, and, most recently, deepening inequalities driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our analysis of the September 2020 fire shows that the judgment of the young asylum seekers was based on weak and contradictory evidence, suggesting the inhumane management of the camp by Greece and the EU required a scapegoat for a disaster that was designed to happen. Demonstrating that the tragedy of Moria does not ultimately lie in its final act of burning, but in its very existence.